There we go. All right. Tonight, we have um, me as our regularly scheduled person. Um, oh, but next welcome. week, we are going to have our very first guest speaker on our Zoom Mixed Bag Musings. Um, so that's very exciting. We're going to welcome um, Pastor Janet Chapman from First Christian Church. And she is going to talk to us about the question, do animals have spiritual lives? Which I am very interested to hear about. I am too. Um, I am the reason too. I invited her to come and speak to us rather than doing my own lesson like I usually do is because she was on sabbatical last spring and her sabbatical was about the spiritual lives of animals. She traveled hmm. to Rome and she spent a lot of time studying um, St. Francis of Assisi, who is the patron saint of animals. And um, her congregation did some study on, on animals and their spiritual lives. And so when she came back, she had all kinds of things to share. And she has been um, doing the digital circuit and doing all kinds of presentations for her denomination and her churches in her region. And so yeah. she was willing to share with us some of the, um, some of the, her experience and some of what she learned, which I think will be way more interesting than me sharing what I can find on the internet because she actually got to be in these places focusing on this yes. for an extended period of time. So I'm really excited about that. Mm -hmm. But um, for this jealous. week, we're stuck with just boring old Katie as, as usual. You're not boring ever. <laughs> and this week's question is, can the Bible be used as a behavioral guide? So this is a good question. I am interested to take a look at this one tonight um, with, with you in terms of, you know, how, how do we read the Bible and, um, you know, what is the Bible for? So as usual, we start with our assumptions. And the assumption that I want to bring to our conversation tonight is that use should follow intention. Um, when we think about why something is written or why something is made, then that helps us to understand how we ought to use it. For example, um, you know, when I was when I was growing up, I had a grandfather and a stepfather who both did some some various um, tool related things, you know, making things with with hammers and and screwdrivers and things like that. And one of the things that I was taught was that you should always, use the right tool for the job. Because if you don't, right. then you might end up hurting yourself or hurting the project in some way. And unfortunately I have not, um, I have not followed that, <laughs> that advice all the time, uh, much to my own detriment, but you know how we are, we get lazy and don't feel like running across the house to go and get that correct screwdriver. So I just use this one that I can force to, to work, um, but we end up getting ourselves into trouble when we do those types of things, unfortunately. Yeah. A lot of times. So it's the same thing when we're thinking about, um, when we're thinking about scripture, what is it, what is it, the intention of it? Is the intention that it be used to um, hammer in a nail or is the intention that it be used to um, screw in a screwdriver? Two very different tools, two very different intentions. Two, therefore, two very different um, designs, and therefore, two very different uses. Um, same thing with with scripture. What is the intention of the scripture, and how does that um, help us to understand how we ought to use it? Um, and I think when we're talking about scripture in particular, there are two sets of intentions that we want to give some attention to. Um, the first one is the intention of the author. What, what, why did this author write this, uh, this set of writings? Um, for what purpose? Um, you know, who was the audience? What is, um, what is the genre are some questions that we should be asking ourselves when we're thinking about um, how we use the Bible. Um, when we're thinking about something, for example, like genre, you know, we have to ask ourselves things like, what kind of writing is this? And is it the kind of writing that you should use um, to get in, get you know as a behavioral guide. Um, for example, would you look for advice on how to live your life from the newspaper 
here's an interesting headline that I saw. Planes forced to land at airports. Well, <laughs> if you read that, you might think, okay, well, planes don't typically land at airports. And so if you saw a plane landing at an airport, then your behavior would be very different than if you, you know, assumed that planes regularly land at airports. You would think that there's a problem of some kind. And so your behavior would be would be framed by what it is that you're reading, just like, you know, when we're talking about potentially using scripture as a behavioral guide. But I don't think anybody here would say that, yes, I use the newspaper as a behavioral guide, um, other than maybe you look at the weather page and see if it's raining today or not. And then you decide if your behavior is going to include an umbrella or not. That, that I think is is a is a fair reason to use the newspaper as a behavioral guide, but otherwise maybe not. Um, or what about a personal letter? If someone writes you a letter and sends it to you in the mail, are you going to hold on to that for the rest of your life and use it to guide, um, guide your decision-making in all sorts of different areas of your life? Maybe, maybe not. It depends on you know, the content of the letter and the intention of the author. Um, so again, I brought you a kind of, um, humorous example of, of a letter. This letter happens to be written to Santa Claus. And it says, Dear Santa Claus, it's Claire again, but I'm writing for my nine-year-old brother named Mitch. He wants a binder. Um, binder hole puncher. I want a hole puncher too. And a skateboard. But don't get don't give the skateboard to him. Mitch is very kind-hearted but has a bad temper. He also writes messy and doesn't like to read. Bye, Mitch. P.S. This is not his sign. <laughs> so this person, this girl, um, was asked to write this letter on behalf of her brother. And it is telling Santa Claus how to behave. It's telling him that, uh, you know, it's telling him what Mitch wants for Christmas. But it, then it also says, don't give him some of the things that he's asking for. <laughs> and then it explains why. Well, he's very kind hearted, but he has a bad temper and he writes messy and he doesn't like to read. So he probably wasn't very well behaved this year and he doesn't deserve that skateboard. And so when we read a letter from someone, you know, we can choose to take the advice that's that's in it or we can choose not to. Um, but what if the audience of the letter is not us? What if, you know, what if the writer is not writing to us? And what if, you know, we're not the ones that are writing? Um, and obviously when we're, when we're thinking about letters in the Bible, we are not the, you know, the, the initial audience. Um, in some ways, I think we can argue that we are, you know, kind of a, a secondary um, intended audience, at least in terms of the uh, long, longevity and use of, of those scriptures. Um, but to understand, you know, why the writer was originally writing and who the original audience was and what they were trying to get across helps us to place ourselves and, and to kind of create parallels and to um, see, see ways of, um, of finding ourselves in the story. It's possible when we think about, you know, the audience of one of these, these letters that we are uh, a third possible, you know, we have, we have a more of a connection to a third possible party. We're not the writer, we're not the, the audience, but we're a third party. For example, um, in the, the letter that Paul wrote to um, his friend um, Philemon about Philemon's slave Onesimus, when we read that and we try to understand the context of what slavery looked like in the Roman world and um, you know, how, how all of that worked, maybe we have to place ourselves in, in the place as, of Philemon, of the person who was receiving the letter, um, so that we can understand, you know, what our responsibilities are as people who have power, who have, um, you know, the finances to, to, um, to make or break the lives of, of other people. Um, but there may be other places where we are not the addressee, and we can't connect ourselves in that way. Um, letters where the people who are being addressed are people who are are vulnerable and weak and powerless in in a particular situation, uh, because in many ways we are, you know, we are the the power um, in in the context in which we live. And so we have to think about those types of things when we're asking questions about 
the use of scripture um, as a behavioral guide. But I think scripture is special in that we don't just have to think about the intentions of the human author, we also have to think about the intentions of the Holy Spirit, of God, um, you know, looking to, um, to use the writings of this human person to somehow bring God's message to a wider audience, to the whole world. And so then we need to start asking questions about scriptural authority. Why is scripture authoritative? What makes it authoritative for our lives? 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years in some cases after, um, after it was written. And we have to, you know, we have to think about um, how we might, you know, how we might place that. Uh, we could just say, oh, well, you know, because it exists, then that just automatically means that, you know, that's what God wants to have in our scriptures. But when we think about the history of how, um, how certain books made it into the Bible and some didn't, there have been different, um, different sets of criteria that have been used to determine whether something will, will or will not be included um, in, in the Bible and different groups of people over the course of time have made those decisions. And so trying to think about, you know, what, where is God in that process and how do we, um, you know, how do we find, um, how do we find some kind of consensus on the authority of the Bible? And so there are, um, there are three, um, there are three categories that um, are, are typically used when um, talking about scriptural authority from a theological perspective. Uh, the first one is what they call the divine qualities. Um, in, in the Latin of the reformers who use these kinds of categories to try to understand scriptural authority, they called them um, indicia or something like that. I don't speak Latin, um, but something like that. So kind of indicators um, is, is the, the English word that comes from the, this word. And the indicators for, um, for these reformers typically are um, the age of the writings, that the writings are old and um, and come from a long time ago. Um, and so God, you know, clearly brought them through time to us today. Um, another one of the indicators that something is has divine quality is that the, the human actors in the stories, in, in the writing, um, do not behave in logical human ways. So for example, um, when we have stories where um, people are making um, choices that are selfless, that, you know, that, that kind of go against um, what, what we would expect from a human being, then the reformers would call that um, the divine quality of scripture because humans are incapable of doing anything that isn't selfish. And so the fact that these characters in, in these stories are doing something else means that God is, is with them and, and therefore this story is of value um, as scripture. And then um, the third thing that makes, um, that, that gives uh, a writing divine quality is its impact. Um, the, the, the reform, some of the reformers said that um, nobody martyrs themselves for something that isn't special. And so the, the fanaticism of people who adhere to particular writings or the teachings of particular writings um, can, can give it authority. If you, you know, if, if over the course of time, you see people literally sacrificing their lives in light of what they've learned or in light of you know the their their desire to um to support or to um to adhere to a particular set of teachings then your conclusion is either these people are insane literally insane or that there's something special about this that makes their sacrifice sane that makes it worth it that makes it something uh, something special that that maybe we should pay attention to also. And so these divine qualities of age, um, content, and impact um, 
are one of the ways that um, the reformers said that we can determine if, um, if scripture um, is authoritative for our lives. Uh, but it's not just about the divine qualities. They, they have other logical um, uses that, that uh, logical reasons that they bring up. And the next one is um, called corporate reception. Um, when a writing is used over and over and over again, over the course of time, over decades and centuries and millennia, and over the course of distance over you know, different geographic areas, and it is found to you know, contain truth, then you can say that there is something special about it, that, that it, it has authority, not just for its original audience, but for everyone. And so consensus and historical application of, um, of a particular set of writings is another reason why um, the reformers said that um, scripture might, you know, might be considered to be authoritative. And then the final category is um, about the authors, um, the authors of the, the human authors of the writing. Um, and this is something that um, recent scholars have really started to, um, to kind of fuss over because during the Reformation, there was still the sense that um, whoever claimed a writing in, for example, the New Testament or, or even in the Old Testament with, you know, with, with something being called Isaiah or Jeremiah or something like that, the assumption was that that was written by that person. And so there are a lot of writings in the New Testament that have Paul's name on them. Um, but nowadays we have we have expanded our um, our understanding and knowledge of um, the the context and the time period of the early church, and we have um, we have kind of discovered new types of writings. And now we understand that just because Paul's name was on something doesn't mean that Paul actually wrote it. That that was kind of common to pick up the the name of a very popular figure and put their, that person's name on your writing to get people to pay attention to it. And so um, not every, according to scholars today, not everything in the New Testament that has Paul's name on it was actually written by Paul. Not everything in the New Testament that was written by Peter was, or not everything that has Peter's name was written by Peter. And same thing with our Old Testament. Um, you know, for example, I took a class on the second and third sections of Isaiah and we talked about how if there even ever was a person, a, a prophet named Isaiah, um, the, the second and third sections of that book definitely were not written by that person because they were written many, many years after the, the events um, that take place in, um, in the beginning of the, that book that describe the experiences and, um, and visions of this person named Isaiah. And so if one of the ways that we know that scripture is authoritative is because the authors are authoritative. But then we realize that, you know, Moses didn't write, didn't necessarily write the first five books of the Bible. Then, you know, how, what do we do with that? Does that make scripture um, still authoritative or not? So those are, those are some questions that we kind of have to think about as we're, we're working through this. Um, I would say, yes, Scripture can still be authoritative because it's not really about the humans who wrote them. It's not really about the, you know, the infallibility or the inerrancy uh, or, or not of the, the, the text itself. Because what, what ultimately matters, I think, is that we receive the gift of faith from the Holy Spirit that opens our eyes and hearts to see the value of these writings. So regardless of, you know, their, their age, their, you know, all, all these different things, whether people were willing to die for, for them, um, even, you know, even, and I say this as, as, a, as a, um, uh, somebody who was not trained as a Lutheran, I'm sure Bob is somewhere very angry at me for saying this, even though he doesn't hear me saying it, even the fact that it's about, you know, the, that we have this historical consensus over the, the idea of tradition. Um, and, and then certainly the idea that we have to have authoritative authors that are these big names in, in, in our faith. Um, none of those things 
I think are necessary to make scripture authoritative um, any more so than, um, than other sources of writing. Um, there have been novels and things that I've read in my life that I feel um, spoke truth to me about who God is and who I am um, in, in a way that that scripture has done in the past. Um, but what makes scripture scripture is these things that I read a novel once and it really impacted me, but that doesn't necessarily mean that if Jim reads it or Karen reads it or somebody who is currently living in Saudi Arabia reads it, that they will get that same impact that I did. Whereas we have seen the evidence that the, the scriptures that we have in our Bible today did have that, that longevity, that, that um, broad consensus, that broad impact. And so, so um, when, we're, when we're thinking about using something to guide our behavior, not only do we have to think about um, why, you know, why we're allowing it to have that kind of authority for us, um, but we also have to think about what it's, in, what's it, what it's intending to do. So both of those things I think are really important for us to keep in mind um, as we start to, to consider this question. So any questions or, or comments about that before we jump in? Okay. You said that it's been researched out and that that person didn't write this. Is this the first time that that's being done or was it done earlier? And they say uh, history repeats itself. So did somebody 200 years ago, three, 400 years ago, do the same thing that you just did? And come up with the same answer. Is that correct? Am I making myself clear? No. Can you can you ask that again? How do you, is there any way of knowing that this hasn't been done in the past? What you have done, like question and investigate when it was printed in that and. So you say, okay, it all comes together. Question A has been answered correct, B, C, and D. How do you know that, or do you even have any clue that this has been done before? Am I still making myself clear? Um, so you're you're talking about the the process of determining when particular books in the Bible were written and and who wrote them and, and right. And all those types of things. I, I think that's something that um, has has developed um, more so in in the last several centuries as we've as we've gotten more into um, a, a historical critical um, model for understanding the Bible. That we think you know we think more critically about these things. And I'm not saying that you know nobody ever asked these questions, but I think it has become more prominent um, in in the last few centuries to you know to ask questions like that there you know in in the middle ages for example when you know when when biblical study was really really important to um, the scholastics they had their set of of ways that they understood were you know appropriate ways to interpret scripture and um, those 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 uh, methods came from um, you know from their traditions they came from their their context and and their cultures where you know they they were trying to make sense of their world and then they applied the same tactics that they used for their world to you know to their bible and um and so those types of you know those types of decisions that they made were not because they were ignorant in some way it's just because they you know they lived in a different context than us we live in a world where you know it, it's all about the individual and each each person gets to kind of make their own destiny and all you know all these postmodern ideas um, that are are pretty new um, comparatively speaking and that impacts the way that we read and and and, and, and interpret and apply um, you know the scripture even though it's the same words that everybody's always had the way that we interpret it when what we bring to it is going to um, 
is going to be different. And so I don't think anybody today, you know, feels that we, you know, we finally arrived. We finally understand exactly who wrote each one of these things and we're never going to, you know, find out any more about it. I think that we hold more loosely to, um, to our theories today, but, um, but, but I think that in, 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 in I, I even think this because of the context that I come out of, but I think that that's helpful. I think that assuming, for example, that the first five books of the Bible were written by Moses um, kind of limits us in our understanding of what, what those stories might mean and um, limits us in terms of exploring, you know, what, what God's relationship is to us. I really like the idea that all kinds of different nameless people were part of passing along these stories and then writing down these stories and then um, editing together these stories to make bigger stories and um, you know writing them down again and again and copying them and passing them along through generations and generations um, so that what I get today is the work of thousands and thousands of people over the course of time in their attempts to, you know, be faithful to, to the witness of God, um, rather than the idea that some, some important guy like Moses, you know, sat down one day and wrote all this stuff down and then it just got, you know, handed along and nobody else got to be part of that, um, creative and, and, um, faith-based process. Um, so I, I think it's, I think it's a, a, a long process of understanding. Um, but I think that we are, we're, we're some of the earliest people to kind of think about it that way. Does that answer your question, Jim? Yes. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. All right. So this week, we are actually going to jump pretty much right into the question itself, which is not something that we typically do, um, because I think it's a pretty, actually a pretty simple question. Can the Bible be used as a behavioral guide? I think there's a pretty obvious answer to that question, which is yes, it yes. can be. It can. Um, there is a really interesting book that came out, oh gosh, 10, 10 years ago now, maybe, um, called The Year of Living Biblically. And it's by a guy named A.J. Jacobs. And he was raised um, as, you know, as, as, as basic, basically an atheist or an agnostic. His family didn't really do anything with re their religion. But ethnically and, or, and culturally, I guess, um, he, he is, is Jewish. And so, um, you know, he, he decided, he was, he's an author, and he decided that he wanted to write a book um, about trying to follow the Bible. Um, for a year. So I want to read to you just an excerpt from, um, from his book and the process that he went through um, in, in terms of putting together um, his, his plan. And the reason why he chose the Bible was because he had just finished writing another book. And um, in that book, he had read the um, Encyclopedia Britannica from cover to cover. <laughs> And he had, his book was about the experience of reading the Encyclopedia Britannica from cover to cover. And so now he decided that he was going to move on to a, an even bigger book, a, a book that is, you know, the, the most popular book in, in all of history, the Bible. And so um, he, he started thinking about how he wanted to do this. So I'm going to, I'm going to read this excerpt um, from the book to you. It says, I've read bits and pieces of the Bible before but never the whole thing, never straight through from Genesis to Revelation. So that's what I do for four weeks, five hours a day. Luckily, I'm used to marathon reading from my Britannica project, so it felt pleasantly nostalgic. As I read, I typed into my power book every rule, every guideline, every suggestion, every nugget of advice I find in the Bible. When I finish, I have a very long list. It runs 72 pages, more than 700 rules. The scope is astounding. All aspects of my life will be affected, the way I talk, walk, eat, bathe, dress, and hug my wife. Many of the rules will be good for me and will, I hope, make me a better person by the end of the year. I'm thinking of no lying, no coveting, no stealing, 
love your neighbor, honor your parents, dozens of them. I'll be the Gandhi of the Upper West Side. But plenty of other roles don't seem like they'll make me more righteous at all. Just more strange, more obsessive, more likely to alienate, alienate friends and family. Bathe after sex. Don't eat fruit from a tree planted less than five years ago. Pay the wages of a worker every day. And a good number of the rules aren't just baffling, but federally outlawed, as in destroy idols, kill magicians, sacrifice oxen. So this guy decided that he was going to use the Bible as, as much as possible for an entire year as a behavioral guide. So obviously the answer to this, this basic question is yes, you can use the Bible as a behavioral guide. But very quickly, what happens to AJ Jacobs is he realizes that he's gonna have to make some decisions about how to follow the Bible, to how to use it as a behavioral guide. And so he, he thinks about and, and brings up um, an important distinction that we've, we've talked about a little bit before, but I wanna touch on this again. And that is different ways of interpreting and understanding the Bible. And the first category that I wanna talk about for just a couple minutes is the literal reading, literal reading of the Bible. You're supposed to look at the text and as much as possible, take the pure meaning of the text on its face and, and work with that. But what happens to A.J. Jacobs is he realizes that um, you know this might not go particularly well for him. So he brings up this particular passage first. This is from Matthew chapter 19. It says, for there are eunuchs who have been so from birth and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by others. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let anyone accept this who can. So, um, there was an early church father named Origen, and there is a tradition that Origen read this passage and he took it literally. And he decided that what, and this is, this is a speech from Jesus. He decided that what this meant was that anyone who wants to work for the kingdom of heaven needs to become a eunuch. And so he made himself a eunuch. And this is, this is we don't know if this is true of Origen or not. It's a, it's a tradition around him. But A.J. Jacobs decided that that was not going to be something that he was willing to do for his year of living biblically. Um, but it's not just, you know, it's not just affecting individual people. It affects um, this, this literal reading thing affects people um, in, in communities as well. Um, so another example of literal reading comes from um, Genesis chapter three, verse 16. This is um, where, where God is responding to the, um, the decision that Adam and Eve made to eat the fruit from the tree that they were forbidden from eating. And God says to the woman, I will in greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. So this was not really any, any problem um, for, for Christian people until 1845. In 1845, um, a doctor named Crawford Long decided that he was going to dose his wife with ether when she was in labor with their child. And so on December 27th, 1845, the very first anesthesia was used during labor and it went really well. And so over the course of the next several years, it started to spread and it became very popular for women to be anesthetized to some degree while they were in labor to reduce the, the pain of labor. And of course this over the course of time leads to what we've got today um, you know, with, with um, spinal tapping and, and all these types of things that we do, epidurals. Um, but it's really interesting because when this happened, there was a public outcry about this practice of using ether on women when they were in labor because people who read the Bible literally said childbirth pain is ordained by God. Women must experience that because it is their punishment for having, you know, having participated in this original sin. 
And so we cannot, even though science has allowed us to do so, we cannot use this science in this way. Because when we read this, it literally says that God is greatly increasing pangs in childbearing in response to this sin. And so we can't take that away. We, we have to leave that as it is because we're reading the Bible from a literal perspective. And so when we think about using the Bible as a behavioral guide, can it be used? Yes. But we have to be really careful about the way that we're using it because it's going to have a pretty big impact. Um, so the the alternative, and not this isn't the only alternative, but the the modern alternative um, to a literal reading of the Bible is called historical critical reading. And I, I mentioned this um, just a couple minutes ago. The idea that when we're reading the Bible, we shouldn't just read the words themselves, but we should read the context. We should read the culture. We should read into trying to figure out who the person was that wrote this and why they wrote it and when they wrote it and what it is that they're trying to get across um, to, to their audience and who their audience is. All these questions are important for us to be able to interpret it properly. And this idea of historical critical reading is um, fairly, fairly new for Christians, but it's actually ancient um, for the Jewish people. So um, Jim, this might even help a little bit with, with your question from earlier. Um, mm -hmm. Traditionally, um, Jewish people, and I, I think this would apply generally speaking across um, Judaism, but you, you're going to have, you know, conservative Jews and more liberal Jews that that are um, that are more likely to use historical critical reading. But um, the belief is that the Bible is kind of a shorthand um, for to to express God's law, to express how God wants us to live. And some Jews believe that it's so condensed, it's, it's a sh such shorthand that it's almost in code, that you need people who are well-educated, which they call rabbis, to unravel the Bible, to help to interpret and help people understand what this stuff means so that they can actually use it in an everyday sense. And there are books that have been developed um, in the last 2000 years by, by Jews, by rabbis um, that are based on the teachings of these rabbis and their interpretations of the scriptures. So for example, you look at um, the, the, the fourth commandment, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So the Bible says that we are supposed to rest. On the seventh, the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. So what does that mean? When the Bible tells us that we have to rest on the Sabbath, that we're not allowed to do any work, what does that actually mean? And so in the Jewish context, that's what the rabbis are for. The ancient rabbis talked about this constantly. They would get together and they would debate about what this means. And so you could ask questions like, well, if, if, Sunday is, or you know, if, if the Sabbath day for them, Saturday is the day of rest, then are you allowed to exercise is, or is that work? Are you allowed to cook or is that work? Do you have to just, you know, eat whatever leftovers you've got in the refrigerator? Um, are you allowed to log on to amazon.com and order a book or is that work? Um, all of these questions about how we use the Bible as a behavioral guide aren't there in the plain text. You can't read literally this passage to understand how it is that we're supposed to honor the Sabbath day. And so the, the, in the Jewish tradition, the way that you answer that is by sitting around with a bunch of other Jewish smart people and debating about it and figuring it out. And then when you come to some kind of consensus, you write it down and then you pass it along to the, the future generations. And that is actually um, the, a pro the process of understanding the Bible that Jews have been using for, for 2,000 years or, and more. Ever since they, they lost their temple and you know, had, to, had to become, quote unquote, people of the book, um, that's, that's what they've been doing to understand you know, how, how this applies to them and what they should do. Um, and then... But this, this historical critical sense um, applies also 
to, um, you know, to, to our New Testament. And so I brought um, an example from Matthew chapter 19. And this was actually, um, Uh, one that we talked about a few weeks ago, or maybe more than a few weeks ago now, uh, when we talked about whether um, whether a Christian can marry more than one person. Uh, but it's it's a good example of the use of um, historical critical reading to really understand what uh, what a passage is really getting at. Um, this is um, the the Pharisees, the the teachers of the law, say to Jesus, "Why did Moses command us to give a certificate of dismissal and divorce?" Uh, and divorce her, namely their wives. This is the middle of a conversation where Jesus is telling them not to divorce their wives. And Jesus said to them, it was because you were so hard-hearted that Moses allowed you to divorce your wives, but at the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for unchastity and marries another commits adultery. So um, if you remember back to our conversation about um, marrying more than one person, or even better, when we when we talked about divorce um, a long time ago, um, I brought up this interesting story from the Presbyterian Church um, when they were looking at this issue and they were trying to figure out what this means, unchastity. So you you can only get divorced legitimately in the event of unchastity. And they talked about how you know they they wanted to use other scripture to help to guide them in their understanding of what this meant. And they found so many passages in the Bible that are about love and about God's desire for us to live the best lives that we can and to support one another and, you know, to, to um, be, be the best people for each other that we can. And they came to the conclusion that when we are in a relationship with someone that you know has has been made publicly um, professed and everything like we do with marriage, but that relationship is not bringing life to us. We are not, um, you know, we are not making each other our best selves. We are not bringing that um, that joy and and that good news into one another's lives. Then that is unchastity itself. It's not literally unchastity. It's not cheating but it is it is a lack of commitment to the relationship and it results in you know it results in in bad relationships and and bad lives for the people that and god doesn't want that for us and so they they didn't say so this this passage no longer applies they said this passage does apply but what we have to do is we have to understand what jesus meant by unchastity and I don't think that he meant literally just cheating with your body, cheating with your heart, cheating with your mind, cheating with your soul by cheating this person of the relationship that they should have, that God desires for them to have. And so it's okay to get divorced if it's just a matter of, you know, not getting along or it, it's definitely okay to get divorced if it's a matter of being abusive. Somebody in the relationship is being abusive in some way because that is cheating on the relationship. That is cheating the relationship. So you can see how, you know, how this historical critical interp interpretive method is very different than looking just at the literal words themselves, but it's helpful for, um, you know, for, for understanding how to apply conversations and stories that were written in such a different context from our, our lives today. So any, any questions, comments about that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So can the Bible be used as a behavioral guide? Yes. But Katie, now, I was, oh, I, yeah, Cindy. I'm sorry. That's okay. It took me a while for my mouse to cooperate. <laughs> um, uh, I This is just an observation. I find it interesting so often how people who are either culturally or religiously Jewish open our thinking as Christians. Mm -hmm. Like for instance, the, the man who wrote the book, um, Your God is Too Small, mm -hmm. was also 
um, Jewish. And it just, I, I just think that they, of course, that's our heritage, but that they bring a fresh, they bring fresh eyes to what we have long believed. That's just my observation. Yeah, um, one of my favorite classes that I took in college was an Old Testament class um, with a, a Jewish professor. It was obviously not called Old Testament. It was called um, Intro to Hebrew Scriptures. But we read, you know, some of these stories that are so familiar to me. Um, but the the assumptions that he made and the interpretations that he laid out to us were just so foreign to me that it completely blew up my, my you know, the, the assumptions that I had and, and that, that I felt, you know, oh, well, this is obviously the interpretation of this. No, it isn't obviously the interpretation of this. It's just what you think is obviously the interpretation because you have limited yourself to your experience and your context. But in a completely different context, this means something completely different. And, you know, very basic stuff, like, like the, the story of, of the fall, Jews don't even call it the fall. They don't think that it's a bad thing that, that Adam and Eve um, chose free will because that opened up a true relationship with God. You can't have a relationship with someone that doesn't have the free will to choose not to be in it. Then they're just puppets. They're not really your friend or your, you know, your spouse or, or whatever it is that it is that relationship. And it's the same thing with God. God can't be in a relationship with a being that doesn't actually have the ability to choose to be in that relationship or choose how to respond to that relationship. And so that's how, you know, that's how he expressed the, the interpretation of that story to us. And I just, I was just totally blown away by that. But that's, you know, that helps, helps us to, you know, to see a different way and to see that there are different ways and that therefore maybe we shouldn't hold so tightly to, you know, to our ways in other areas too. So agree. Thank you, Cindy. Um, all right. So now that we've established, technically we've answered the question, yes, you can use the Bible as a behavioral guide, but should we use the Bible as a behavioral guide? And I want to, um, I want to answer this question by using an example from, or a couple of examples from the life of Jesus. And I need to give you just a little bit of background information so that you'll understand what is happening in, um, in the two stories that I want to share with you. So um, during the, the time of Jesus, there were, um, there were several different, um, I don't know what to call them, like castes or, or groupings of Jewish people within, within the culture of, um, of, of, of Judea. There first there were Sadducees, and Sadducees were the wealthier class for the most part. They had a lot of political power. Um, they were centered in Jerusalem because Jerusalem was one of you know one of the main capitals in the Roman Empire in that region, and so they were centered in Jerusalem, and therefore they had most of the control over um, over the temple. They um, they had a lot of um, power in the Sanhedrin, which is a, a, a governmental body within, um, within Judaism at the time. And they were the ones who did a lot of the negotiating with the Romans. So the Romans obviously were the ones who had the real political power. And in order to get some political power for themselves, the Sadducees worked with the Romans. And the Sadducees had a very literal understanding of scripture. They didn't believe that they should be taking those oral scriptures that I described to you about how the rabbis would talk to each other and, you know, and kind of extrapolate out what something meant. They didn't believe that that was scripture. They didn't believe that that should be considered. Um, and some, you know, some scholars have wondered about why, why they had that position. And some have said that perhaps they were looking to, um, to minimize the amount of being Jewish that they had to do, because if you have fewer scriptures and they're more confusing, then it's a lot easier to get slippery with it and to start to conform more to the Roman and Greek culture that was surrounding them in terms of, you know, where the power was coming from. And so if 
if they, you know, and if they did that, if they conformed as much as possible, then they would please the people with political power and then maybe maintain or even increase their own power. And so that might be a reason why the Sadducees kind of fell into this, this category of interpreting literally, because it's so much easier to ignore or, and, you know, explain away why you aren't adhering to things that you don't like if you minimize and, and make, keep it confusing as possible. Um, whereas for the Pharisees, which is the second group of people in, um, of, of Jews in, in Jesus' time, um, the Pharisees are uh, the people that have more of the religious power. Um, the, the Sadducees ran the temple, and so they they did all of the you know sacrificing of the animals and things like that. But people didn't do that every day. They um, they spent their time you know living out in their little villages in the countryside, and they went to Jerusalem only on special occasions. And so the real religious power was in the communities among the people, and that was where the Pharisees were. They centered their time and their energy in the synagogues which were the small worship spaces um, in the towns rather than in the temple in Jerusalem. Um, the Pharisees hated the Romans. They wanted to get rid of them. Um, as I told you before, the Pharisees spent time in deep debate about scripture's meaning. They had all kinds of different interpretational methods. They used scripture to interpret scripture. Um, they would, you know, they would talk about these things endlessly so that they could try to understand um, how to apply different scriptures to every different aspect of life. And this makes sense too, because when they, um, when they would extrapolate out meaning and when they would go away from a an, an literal interpretation, that actually helped them to delegitimize their enemies, the Sadducees, and give themselves more legitimacy because the Sadducees claimed that they were um, the, the, uh, the descendants of um, Aaron, Moses' brother Aaron, and therefore they should be in charge because Aaron was made the, the first priest of the Jewish people. And so as, um, as the priest, they, uh, as the priestly caste, they, you know, had, they had that kind of power. But the Pharisees were trying to say, no, you know, what you're doing is wrong. And um, we can prove that by interpreting these scriptures and, and explaining them better. Um, so, so two different groups, two different perspectives, two different ideas about how you read and, and um, apply scripture. So any, any questions about that? I know that's kind of, kind of vague, but th that's all you, I think you really need to know for what we're, what we're about to look at. Um, but any, any questions that come up on that? Nope. Okay, so I want to bring to you two stories of Jesus encountering members of these two groups. So the first one is going to be um, related to the Sadducees. And we're going to see here that Jesus is, is using the Bible as a behavioral guide, but he's actually using his opponent's interpretational frameworks against them which I think is really interesting. So listen to this. And I didn't put the whole reading here. I just put the, the really important parts, but I'm gonna read you the whole passage. So this is John chapter 10, verses 22 through 39. At that time, the festival, festival of the dedication took place in Jerusalem. It was winter and Jesus was walking in the temple in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews, and because we're in the temple, we know that these Jews that we're, we're, that we're talking about here are the Sadducees. So the Sadducees gathered around Jesus and said to him, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my father's name testify to me, but you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they ne will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my father has given me is greater than all else and no one can snatch it out of the father's hand. The father and I are one. The Jews took up stone again, stones again to stone him. Jesus replied, I have shown you many good works from the father. 
for which of these are you going to stone me? The Jews answered, it is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, though only a human being, are making yourself God. Jesus answered, is it not written in your law? I said you are gods. If those to whom the word of God came were called gods, and the scripture cannot be annulled, <laughs> can you say that the one whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world is blaspheming because I said I am God's son? If I am not doing the work of my Father, then do not believe me. But if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works, so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. Then they tried to arrest him again, but he escaped from their hands. So what Jesus says in the middle there is kind of confusing. So I want to break it down a little bit. Jesus says, is it not written in your law, not the law? Remind, remember that Jesus is one of these people. He's a Jew. He <clears throat> studies these same scriptures as everybody else. But he says, is it not written in your law? I said you were called gods. And we all agree, of course, that scripture cannot be annulled. If it says that, then can you say that the one whom the father has sanctified and sent into the world is blaspheming because I said, I am God's son. So what Jesus is doing here is he is quoting from a Psalm. This is um, from Psalm 82. And I just, this is so interesting. And th this is actually, I think a story that's supposed to be funny to people who are kind of in the know. I'm gonna read to you this Psalm and try to you know try to kind of follow along on on what it what's what it's talking about here but if you don't get it that's okay it says um, god has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods he holds judgment and then he, god speaks how long will you and this is a plural you referring to this group of the of the divine council how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked Give justice to the weak and the orphan, maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute, rescue the weak and the needy, deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk around in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I say, you are gods, children of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations belong to you. So I don't know how much of that that you caught in terms of you know interpretation because I know it's hard when you're not you know reading it reading it along and just listening, but this psalm, the the context in which God says you are God's children of the Most High, is in the context of God criticizing this divine council. It says in the midst of the gods He holds a judgment, and what is it that God is judging? God is saying you, plural, you, other gods, don't give justice to the weak. You don't maintain the rights of the lowly. You don't rescue the weak. You don't deliver them from the hand of the wicked. And therefore, I say to you, you are gods, children of the most high. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. So God is saying, because you, other gods, are not really doing the job of a god. You might be called gods, but you don't deserve to be treated like gods and you won't be treated like gods. Whereas I, the real god, do do justice on behalf of the oppressed and therefore I am worthy of exaltation. So that's what the context of that Psalm says. But Jesus in John 10, pull this little passage out of the context of Psalm 82 and uses it completely arbitrarily. He says, is it not written in your law? I said you were gods. So Jesus says, okay, Sadducees, you really like to read scripture literally. You want to just read the, the words themselves. Well, this particular passage says, I say you are gods. And if God is calling people gods, then how is it blasphemy for me to call myself God's son? If we're gods, then I can say that I'm God's son. That's not a problem. And you can't say anything about it 
because scripture cannot be annulled. Jesus is doing to the Sadducees exactly what they do to people all day long. They grab from the scripture whatever tiny little note they want to, to prove their point and throw it in the faces of people. And that's what Jesus is doing right here, right now. Of course, Jesus knows that that's not the context of this psalm, but that's not how the Sadducees operate. And so Jesus is using their methodology to, to shove it back in their faces, that they're trying to trick him and call him a blasphemer and stone him because of their literal interpretations. So he just turns it around and says, well, I can interpret scripture literally too, and you're not going to like it. So I just, I find, I find humor in this, I think, because this happens to me a lot in my in interactions with people who today are biblical literalists, that they like to, you know, they like to pull out these little bits of scripture and throw them in your face as obvious examples of how I'm wrong. And that's not how I read the Bible. I could do that too, if I wanted to, but that's not how I read the Bible. That's not how the Bible should be used as far as I'm concerned. And so mm -hmm. I don't do it. They feel like they're, they won because they can pull out their little, you know, we call those proof texts. They, they use them to prove, they use little pieces of text to prove their point. They use their proof texts. And so they feel like they won the argument, but they're, they're not even reading the Bible the way that I believe that you're supposed to read the Bible. And so I just have nothing to say to that. And that's why, you know, that's why they think they've won the argument. Jesus says, uh-uh, I'm going to turn this around on you. I'm going to use your very tactics to show that you're wrong, which I just love. I love that so much. It's a little vind vindictive Jesus, I think, <laughs> which we don't see too often. So does everybody understand what's happening here in this story? that Jesus is using the Bible as a behavioral guide, but he's using it almost ironically. He's using it as a behavioral guide in the same way that the people that are arguing with him and trying to kill him do so that they can't come back at him and try something else. He, he's speaking their language, even though he knows that that language isn't really the right way to go about it. I just, I don't know. I find that interesting and, and funny. <laughs> Cindy. Yeah, you could tell I appeared. Um, <laughs> I will. I. One of the things that I have always felt unprepared for is when people throw scripture at me. Mm -hmm. I have always felt like I should do a better job of having memorized specific verses. I can tell you the gist but I can't quote the verse. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when my kids were younger, they wanted to go to Awana. And um, that was one of the things that they really stressed was, you know, putting verses in your heart. Right. But it was something that, and, and Angela is really good at it. I mean, she can, she can quote scripture. I, I can say, well, I know that this is what scripture says, but I can't say in Romans three, mm -hmm. verse eight, you know. Right. Right. But that's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a tactic though. It's a tactic to yeah. shut you down and it's taught to people from a very young age so that they don't even realize that that's what they're doing. But it, it's, it's a bludgeon. It's using the Bible as, as a beater. We literally called them sword drills when I was, when I was young, we would take our Bible and they would say, let's do a sword drill. You have to know how to use your sword. And so we're going to practice using your sword. The Bible is not a sword. The Bible is not a weapon. The Bible is here, now I'm going to give away my ending. The Bible is the manger in which the Christ child is laid. The Bible is the word of God that contains the capital W word of God. It is not a weapon. How dare you make it a weapon? How dare you turn these words into weapons? And that, that is what I think gets me through those conversations because I don't let the people who are arguing with me 
feel like they won because they have a better understanding of scriptural memorization than me, I call them out on that. I say, can you tell me the context of that passage that you just quoted at me? Can you tell me about the author author's intentions? Well, I, I don't, I, I, I can't, no, you know, I, there's, there's no sense of that. And so pointing out that there is more than one way to read is, is very, um, is, 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 is very off-putting for somebody that, that just makes those kinds of assumptions in the same way that they are attempting to off-put you by, you know, quoting at you and, and saying, ha ha, I win because I have more of these little Bible passages memorized than you do. A less vindictive way, if you feel like, you know, you don't want to be as ruthless as me and rude as me, is to memorize one passage that kind of sums up, you know, the whole thing. For God so loved the world. How dare you say that, you know, whatever it is, God is, God is going to judge you because a more important passage says, for God so loved the world. Jesus did that too. I didn't bring that up as an example for today, but there were times when lawyers or st students of the law tried to, you know, tried to, um, tried to quote scripture at him. And then Jesus would just turn around and say, yeah, you can, you can quote obscure passages at me, but I'm going to use the most famous and important passage. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as, as yourself. Let's talk about that for a minute, shall we? Because that proves my point. And that's way more important than this piddling little thing that you pulled out of nowhere. So you could do that too, because Jesus did that. So that's okay to do. <laughs> Um, but, so, but, you know, sometimes they really catch you off guard and, and make you feel inadequate because what happens to me is then I get tongue tied and right. But that's what they're, they're doing that on purpose. They're trying to tongue tie you. They're trying to make you feel inadequate. And so you have to remove yourself from that framework that they've created for you and say, I'm not going to buy into your assumptions. I'm not going to buy into your gameplay here. You know, I'm not going to let you use the Bible as a weapon against me. That's not what it is. And how okay. dare you try to do that? Okay. That's, the only, that's the only way to respond to that stuff. The other thing that you can do is you can go out and you can memorize a whole bunch of scripture so that you can spout it right back at them. But that doesn't do anything either. You know, that doesn't really help. Jesus did it with the Sadducees to, you know, to try to get them to shut up. But what did that do? That made them want to stone him. They tried to arrest him, but he escaped. So playing their game might be fun for a minute, but it doesn't work. It doesn't even work for Jesus. Well, you know, taking a scripture, like that, taking just a phrase or a line of scripture um, completely out of context, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, it, obviously from the studies that we've been doing, you have to read everything around it and then yep. try to figure out why it was there right you do so, but that's so much more work than just well, yeah <laughs> finding the exact words that you need to support your argument and what you want to believe and what you want to do and then just throw that in people's faces that's so much easier so much less work <laughs> but is it faithful no it is no not. it is not all right. Well, I think we get the point here. I'm going to skip the second second example, which was from the Pharisees, but it's the same thing. Jesus uses what the Pharisees do to interpret their scripture for their own purposes and throw, uses their own methods to throw it back in their faces. So same thing. But we just talked about another example anyway with with the lawyer and the and the um, you know the the greatest commandment. So well, let's move on because uh, we're running we're running late. Yeah. So we talked about, can the Bible be used as a behavioral guide? Yes. Should the Bible be used as a behavioral guide? Yes. Jesus does use it as a behavioral guide. But this, you know, th this set of examples shows us that it's the most important question for us to ask is how 
should the, the Bible be used as a behavioral guide? We, I think the thing that makes the Bible universally applicable is the same thing that makes it so dangerous that the Bible isn't just a list of rules. The Bible is a story. It must, it must be interpreted. You can't just read it literally. If God wanted us to just receive these rules and just live by them, then they would have been written down in a much clearer fashion. And you know, none of this story stuff, none of this interpretation stuff. But God gave us what God gave us for a reason. God wants us to partner in the creative task. God wants us to sit and soak ourselves in these stories. You know, that's something that is not wrong about the, the Awana methodology, that it is important for us to immerse ourselves in the Bible. But memorizing tidbits and phrases and, and swaths of scripture is not how you make the Bible part of, you know, part of who you are. Reading those stories, interpreting those stories, talking about those stories in relationships with other people is how you soak in the meaning of those stories. And that's not something that you can do by memorizing, I don't think. Memorizing can, can be a tool that can be used, but if that's the, if that's the main reason what you're, why you're doing what you're doing, then I'm not gonna be part of that because there's no point. I can recite the preamble to the constitution to you too. You know, what does that mean? Who cares? Um, but when we're talking about, you know, using the Bible as a behavioral guide, we have to remember why we're using it and in what way we're using it. Obviously, every person in history has been able to use the Bible to justify their own beliefs or behaviors if they so chose to do to do that. If, if people, you know, if, if people in your, in your culture and your social circle consider the Bible to be an, a source of authority and you're trying to establish your own authority, then what do you do? You borrow the authority of the Bible. You say, look, the Bible agrees with me, but that's already a problem. You'll always find what you're looking to justify if you're looking to justify your own beliefs or behaviors, even if you have to twist and manipulate and pull those verses out of context into proof text to get there, you can always find some way to justify yourself. But is that what we're really trying to do here? Or are we really honestly trying to mold and guide our behavior and our life based on the Bible because of the Bible's authority? Two very different ideas. Is the Bible a behavioral guide or is the Bible a convenient source of, of authority so that I can in, increase my own authority in the eyes of others? So keeping that in mind is really important. Um, here's, my, here's my quote that I gave away. Um, so it's not gonna be as impactful anymore, sorry, but it was important in that moment. <laughs> Martin Luther said, scripture is not Christ. Scripture is the swaddling clothes and manger of Christ in which Christ lies wrapped. So we have to remember that, yes, our scriptures are authoritative. Our scriptures are important, but they are not the capital W word of God. Um, Muslims consider the Quran to be the literal word of God. And so they want their, they want their Quran to be placed on the highest bookshelf in any given library because it, they believe that no other word should be held higher than the word of God. But Christians don't believe that. Christians believe that the Bible is human words doing the human best to describe something indescribable. But the great thing about it is that because so many different people have participated in that process, there is something of truth in, in those words. And what you can find there is not the exact words themselves that are going to change your life, but you're going to encounter that capital W word. You're going to encounter Christ 
in those stories and in those words. And remembering that I think helps you when you're attempting to interpret and use the Bible as a behavioral guide. When you look at a passage, you're looking for, for guidance in terms of how to behave. If you know that scripture is where we find Christ, then you can ask yourself, where is Christ in this? Rather than what does this tell me? Or even worse, how does this, how does this help me to justify the behavior that I want to do? And that's a really dangerous way to approach it because you never know where it's going to guide you. Um, and it's going to, and it's going to make some people angry because that's not how they want to use the Bible and, and using it in that way is going to expose them for, for the people that they are, which is, which is a challenge for people, obviously. So for today's uh, wrap up verse, I bring to you Romans 15, chapter 7. For whatever was written in former day was written for our instruction, so that by steadfastness and by the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So what I ask, I think, in terms of this, this question that we've kind of molded a little, how should the Bible, how should the Bible be used as a behavioral guide? What is that good news? What is the gospel that we should be living out in this situation? Not just for myself, but for all of creation. What is the good news that I can find from this passage? It's, you know, it, it's almost a joke these days because of how it was just so popular in the 90s. But WWJD, what would Jesus do? But not what would Jesus do in terms of, you know, what I want to do and in using Jesus to justify myself, but really listening, listening through prayer, listening through a deep understanding of the entire witness of, of, the, of the scripture and an appropriate, deep understanding of how to read scripture so that you can find out who Jesus is through those scriptures so that you can really encounter Jesus not for who you want him to be, but for, for who he actually is. And, you know, a lot of times we don't like what we see because Jesus challenges us. Bob's been talking to us about that a lot lately in, um, in his sermons. If you haven't listened to his sermon from a few weeks ago called The Invisible People, do it because it's one of the best sermons that he's ever given. And the, that's where, you know, that's where we find, uh, that's where we find real meaning is in really being challenged by what we read, because then we know that we are encountering God and God is changing us. So that is what I have for you on this question. Questions, comments, disagreements. I agree with you about the sermon on the invisible people. It really had an impact on me. Um, when you think about uh, how many times as a child you're told not to make eye contact with somebody or, you know, walking down a street in San Francisco, don't look at them, don't, don't give them an in, you know? Yep. And um, it just breaks my heart now. I mean, looking at it that way, I didn't realize that I was making them invisible. Mm -hmm. But I think that's one of their biggest complaints is that mm -hmm. people don't look at them yeah. and don't recognize them as a fellow human being. Right. right. It's really sad. And that's hard. You know, it's hard to face up to our own complicity. It's hard to face up to, um, to the realities of, of, uh, you know, how the world is and, and how we benefit from it. And so we, we prefer to just, you know, stick with what we like, stick with what we, we know will work for us, right? But that's not, you know, that's not what we're called to. No, but I understand now why old people feel so vulnerable they, you know, they're just not strong enough to um, 
defend themselves if somebody wants to be mean to them, you know. Mm -hmm. And the same is true of women, too. I mean, even somebody that looks nice could be a serial killer, you know. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. it's it's kind of a it's kind of a funny place to be. Mm -hmm. How do you protect yourself and yet do do the right thing for somebody who who needs help? Yeah. Yeah. A smart person several times has said um you know, you, you only get to, you only get to die once. So choose wisely what you're going to die for. It's easy for yeah. us to say, well, as Christians, we're supposed to die to self and, and, you know, serve others and all these types of things. But the reality is we have to navigate living in this world. And, you know, how do we, how do we maintain some of the power that we have and use it for good but also, you know, not alienate the people that we're trying to to partner with um, in that. I mean, that's that's kind of where we are right now with our Good Water Crossing project because we, you know, we we are frustrated as a church that it's taking so long to work with the city and get the permits and all the things that need to happen. But at the same time, we know that the only way that this is going to succeed is if we partner with the government. And so, you know, how far can we go to be a prophetic voice and to push them? And how far should we, you know, and, and where should we stop to maintain that relationship and make sure that we are um, working together and, and staying on the same boat? It's a really hard question. And we're not the only ones asking it. Even our, our friends in El Salvador are in the same place right now on a national level because they're trying to get their um, new constitution passed. And in El Salvador, the secular government has to approve their new constitution before they can implement it. They've been waiting for months and months and months for this to happen. But at the same time, they need to speak out about the atrocities that are going on in El Salvador right now with, you know, taking away human rights and, and um, surrounding cities so that they can ferret out any person that might be connected to a gang. And then you just put people away for 40 years without a trial. Um, you know, that's, that's something that the church feels called to speak out against. But how do they do that when they have this relationship with the government that they need them? They need them to approve their constitution so that they can continue to function. Um, and these are not easy, you know, easy conversations and easy questions to answer. It's hard, always hard. Mm -hmm. If you can understand it, it's not God, right? Like our Augustine quote. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You have any final thoughts, Cindy? No, actually not. I'm just digesting it as always. All right. I know Patty's always over there digesting too. So, all right, friends. Well, I will wrap it up here. So like I said, next week, we are going to have our guest speaker do animals have spiritual lives? I'm really excited. I hope everybody can make it and invite a friend because this was a good opportunity to hop on once and not feel like they have to keep coming back because I'm not even, you know, I'm not, the regular teacher isn't even going to be the teacher. So I won't be offended if they come for one time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Well, take care. Thank you. Thank I'm you, Katie. See you on Sunday. Thank you. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye, Karen. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.